So yeah, so uh, let's just get started. Thank you so much for uh, coming on again. I appreciate it. Uh, I feel like the last time we talked was um, was the week before LSU beat Bama. Yes, I, I was living in Alabama at that time, and somebody had offered me a couple tickets to a friend of mine to join me. So that was a hell, hell of a fun week to be an LSU fan, living in yeah. Alabama especially at the time. But now, so where uh, so. Um, just for people, I guess, who aren't familiar with you, uh, just kind of give a quick background on yourself uh, just so they get to know you. So uh, I'm a professor of economics at Southeastern Louisiana University now. Um, previously, last time that you and I talked, actually, I was at Troy University outside Montgomery, Alabama, um, which last year, it was the only year that I worked in Alabama, and it was a very fun year to be an LSU fan behind enemy the state of Alabama because of uh, the incredible season that we had, especially considering most of my students were huge Alabama fans and huge Auburn fans. So they were giving me a lot of, uh, a lot, lot of flack early in the year and uh, I had bragging rights by the end of it. But um, I got my PhD in economics from George Mason University up in Washington D back into, and ever since then I've kind of hopped around as a uh, economics professor up in Philadelphia, New York, Alabama, but now I'm in Louisiana and very happy, uh, very happy to be back in Baton Rouge. What percentage of um, stuff have you read in the Pac-12 movement and their demands? How much of you say would you agree with it or, or uh, disagree? Yeah, in reading through the whole thing, um, I would say I agree with somewhere between 50 and 75 percent of the demands that are listed in the petition. Um, there are some things that the players talk about that I think are things that virtually anyone can agree on. Uh, having clear and transparent safety standards in place for players dealing with COVID-19 uh, and other concerns. Everyone can get behind that type of thing. In fact, that's one of the first thing that, things that's mentioned in the petition. Um, things about the, in the petition, they also talk about allowing players to profit off their name, image, and likeness, something that you and I have talked about a little bit in the past. I'm fully behind that. I think most college fans are moving to the point uh, where they all support that as well, allowing players to make money off their name, image, and likeness so that they can do advertisements, receive compensation for compensation for autographs and things like that. Um, that's kind of an idea that you're seeing gain popularity nationwide. So that's the type of stuff that I think everyone can get behind. And also some things about, um, I think if you actually look at the petition itself, and I'm sorry, I got my notes over here, so let me go ahead and... <laughs> Do, do what you got to do. But they also have they also have some demands about um, yes they also have demands about a one time transfer rule that I think is a great idea allowing players to transfer to another school having to sit out a year uh, that's another idea that I've always really been a fan of where if you decide to transfer to another school you have to sit out an entire season that's a really steep punishment so that's a good demand I think that's in this document that we are united document that most people can get behind. And then also, I really like the demand about allowing players to maintain their eligibility through the draft process, whatever their respective sport is. Yeah. So if you're an LSU football player, let's say that you're uh, Thaddeus Moss or someone who did not get drafted in this draft, was probably expecting to be a late round did. Because of the way that the rules are in place now, he didn't have the option of coming back to school when he didn't get drafted. He was pot committed. He had to sign some type of free agent deal to play in the NFL. And hopefully things work out great for him and the other players who weren't drafted. But under this type of arrangement that the players talk about in the petition, someone like that would be able to go back to school if they wanted to. If they wanted to go back, improve their stock, and then take a shot the next year. And we're seeing that a little bit right now in the NBA. It's not the case that uh, college basketball players can go through the draft process and come back. But college basketball has given players a lot more leeway to test the waters, to go uh, and get feedback from scouts. And I think that's been a great thing for college basketball. I think it makes it more appealing for high school players to play in college, knowing that they can get that feedback from NBA scouts. Um, so those are four things that I think are very good ideas. But there are some things that we can kind of transition to talking about um, some of the poison pills that are, I think are as good of ideas and are probably overly ambitious and will reduce its chances of getting picked up. Yeah, uh, and one thing, I mean, most of the stuff that was in there, uh, like the NIL and, you know, safety precautions with COVID, everybody's been clamoring for that for the past few months, and really for the NIL the past several years. Uh, that's long overdue, but now let's get to the the, the stuff that's maybe not so reasonable. Um, 
<laughs> when they talked about what, what really bothered, I think, most people what, that got big headlines was what they said, we want to own our name, image, and likeness. But then they said, these players said, we want uh, to drastically, voluntarily and drastically reduce excessive pay from the coaches and administrators in performance and academic bonuses and in lavish facility expenditures and use somewhat endowment funds to preserve all sports. Now, where does the hypocrisy begin and end where you're yeah. saying, I, I, I want to own my own name, I want to own my name, image, and likeness like every other student on campus, but I want to take that free market value from coaches and administrators. Those are three of the policies that I had kind of listed here as things that were poison pills, would uh, be deal breakers from uh, the Pac-12 standpoint and from each respective university's athletic department standpoints. Um, I'm with you. I think that trying to eliminate high salaries um, is just a bad idea. Um, and that doesn't apply just to coaches. Like you said, they're also applying that standard to administrators, to people like, if you're looking at a school like LSU, for instance, someone like a Scott Woodward. Well, most LSU fans are not clamoring to see Coach O's pay go down or does his pay go down. They realize how much value those individuals are adding to their respective institutions. It's because they are so good at their jobs that the players are put in position where they're able to succeed. So that's something where, look, and here's what I'll say a little bit in defense of the players with some of these demands that you mentioned um, that I think kind of deal breakers or at the very least overly ambitious, which is that you can kind of view this document as an opening salvo of sorts. Anytime you, you engage in a negotiation, you're going to err on the side of asking too much. I'm looking to buy a house right now. And so whenever I see a house, um, I'm going to always try to bid below the asking price. And in the same way, the players here, they're, they're trying to be very ambitious in this first round of negotiation by listing some, um, what we might view as unrealistic things. But if you view that as a negotiating tactic, it's a little bit more reasonable to realize, okay, my guess is that a lot of the players would be willing to back off the three things that you mentioned, the excess pay for coaches and administrators being reduced, ending performance bonuses, which just seems like a terrible idea. I think you and I would agree. Um, that's a very incentive. It annoys me, just to take an example here from the SEC, if I was a Texas A&M fan, look, I would have been pumped to hire Jimbo Fisher. We were basically guaranteeing him, guaranteeing him $100 million would have been very risky to me in a, what, a 10-year contract or whatever it was. Um, I would have much rather seen my school hire a coach where it was a more reasonable base salary, say three or four million dollars. He stays in college football as a baseline salary, power five head, co head coach, a good program, but that had a bunch of performance bonuses baked into it because then that way my coach could earn a lot more money. They could earn seven, nine million dollars a year, but if they did that, it means they were winning championships and winning a lot of games. So those are exactly the ways that we should be structuring these contracts that I think fans and players can get behind something like that, kind of a deal breaker in my book and just not a very good idea. Um, but again, that was everything that you mentioned just now um, came from section two of the uh, We Are United proposal. There's four sections of it, and that's a section that talks about protecting all sports. And the idea behind that, the last policy that you mentioned was ending lavish facility spending uh, and using endowment funds from the university to preserve all college sports we've seen that some university some universities like stanford being one of the most prominent have had to cut a lot of uh smaller sports sports that are not making any money um in these hard times that they face under covid um you can see why players might say well shoot 22 billion dollar endowment fund just sitting there why can't we use some of that money to save these sports and prevent student athletes from not being able to play what they've got to understand, and I can say this being an academic, someone who works uh, in academia as a professor, is that endowment funding is really not supposed to go to sports. And in fact, the way that academic institutions are ranked, one of the first things that is looked at whenever you're ranking universities in the country, whether it's Harvard, Yale, Stanford, these elite schools, one of the first things that they look at in ranking them is how much of an endowment they have. Because that endowment funding is supposed to be spent over time on academic purposes. So trying to get that money reallocated to athletics, which should be some have athletic departments, 
that are breaking even or making a profit every year, you shouldn't have to be taking money from the academic side of things in order to give it to the athletic side. I'm a huge fan of cohorts, but at the end of the day, academics should be first and foremost the priority of universities, not propping up athletic programs. So yeah, that, those were some other ideas that I just, um, again, I think their heart was in the right place when they put together these proposals, but some of these things, like I said, I agree with 50 to 75% of it, but that other 25, 40, 50% um, is at the very least overly ambitious and in the worst case scenario, kind of a What, uh, so you kind of jumping to like what you said about it's well intentioned, but my, my whole problem with it is, is that the small amount of bad arguments are taking the, away from the overwhelming majority of good arguments that they're proposing. Cause all anybody talked about was, Hey, you can't do this because it's just not realistic. And another thing we haven't brought up yet is uh, distributing 50% of each sport's total conference revenue evenly among athletes in their respective sports, which falls under, you know, a lot of issues with Title IX, which I'm sure you can um, maybe expand upon as, as to why that's illegal, for those who, who don't know. But, I mean, it, the, all of the bad stuff is taking away from the majority of good, and it just shows you that they didn't get good advice on this. Yeah, and that's... I mean, if I was grading this document, the We Are United proposals, um, as a professor, um, again, there'd be some things I'd tell the student, look, you did a great job with this, but these bad arguments that we've talked about, I'm glad that you brought up the 50% uh, conference revenue distribution, which by the way, I'm not exactly positive what they're referring to there. Are they referring to, if we talk about the SEC, for instance, the Southeastern Conference every year gets revenues around $720 million. Are they referring to 50% of that money? So like $360 million being evenly distributed amongst the sports? Are they talking about the $40 million every year the, that LSU gets and each member institution, each member school gets from the SEC in their conference? Or are they talking about the $157 million that LSU earns as an athletic department? So I'd be curious what they meant by that 50% share, but no matter how you slice it, regardless of which of those three it is, that's too much money. And when you bake Title IX considerations into this, where that money would have to go evenly between men's and women's sports, it would basically make most college athletics unviable. It would make it virtually impossible for a lot of these sports to exist in the first place because that fun those funds would have to be allocated evenly between men's and women's sports. And I have plenty of issues with Title IX. It's one of the uh, kind of messy things that happens when you entangle academic institutions with athletics the way that we have in this country. But again, that's one of those poison pills, I think, reduces the chances of this entire document being taken seriously, which is a shame because as we've said all along, there are some very good points that are listed in this that deserve to be taken seriously. But unfortunately, like you said, those headlines are being taken away. Those good ideas, they're being taken away from by the fact there are some not so good ideas that are kind of diluting the value of this message. So what you said you had a problem, kind of Title IX, you, you had a problem with being in athletics. What, why specifically? Really, the point I was making there was more that I think that the model you use right now, um, America is unique in having a system where college sports are such a big money-making. Um, most countries around the world, college sports are not – up there with professional sports in terms of popularity, but as almost kind of an access tree um, with the establishment of the NCAA back in the early 20th cent century under the direction of people like Teddy Roosevelt, who at the time tried to kind of get schools together to agree to abide by the rules of one institution, namely the NCAA. Um, as kind of an accident of history, the fact that in America, um, college sports have always been a popular way of organizing teams. Uh, we have this strange system where what really should be minor league sports and for-profit standalone organizations are tied to academic institutions. Um, and so it, you know, it gets complicated and I almost feel bad coming out and saying that I'm not a huge fan of the college sports system when I'm myself a huge LSU football fan. I love college sports. I love college football, basketball, baseball, more than just about any, any professional. But that said, 
it makes things very complicated when you tie sports that generate a lot of revenue and a lot of money to academics and you have this weird student athlete system that's really, uh, really very much in conflict. And that's why we have this strange system where you have college football players like Joe Burrow, uh, Tua Tagovailoa, millions of dollars for their respective athletic departments and academic institutions, but not being able to profit from that directly. I'd much rather see a system where we allow players to make money off their name, image, and likeness at the very least, but have it look more like minor league sports or something, where these programs are not necessarily to their academic institutions, and they're allowed uh, to manage themselves differently without having to try to prop up sports that don't make any money. Um, so I think a lot of people who follow college sports don't realize that tug of war that's going on, where a lot of people are fans of college athletes making money, but they're not fans of getting rid of don't make money. And the truth is you have it both ways. If you think that college football players should be paid, what you're really saying is that all that money, that $56 million in profits, for instance, that LSU football made in 2019 or 2018, um, all that money is being plowed into propping up basically every other sport besides basketball and baseball at LSU. So if you think that players should be making money because there's too high profits in college sports, what a lot of people don't realize is that they're pretty much saying at the same time that they don't think those other sports should exist, that they should maybe be club sports, because it is those sports like college football and college basketball that are propping up the other ones. And I'm a big fan of allowing players to get paid or at least get money for their name, image, and likeness. But once you do that, you're removing the ability to prop up those other sports in large part. And that becomes a much riskier or at least more controversial proposal. Yeah, uh, it's it's just a mess that I think we've created um, in this country, and it's it's so unique. I mean, I remember a guy who my dad worked with, in um, uh, he dad my dad worked for a tech company, and he works from home, and he has this one guy who's from Canada that has come to visit us a few times, and we took him around to LSU, and he saw Tiger Stadium, and he said, w w w "What the hell is this? Like, is this is this is a college?" I mean, he, he had yeah, never. What is this doing on your college university's campus? Yeah. yeah, it was it was so I mean foreign to him. He said he said I, I can't fathom how a university can do this. Um, and you know, it's just yeah. one of the things that makes America unique. But um, going back to what you said about the 2017, uh, I think he, uh, from Ross Dellinger had posted uh, recently the 2017 uh, profits from LSU's uh, athletic department. He had uh, showed it was 56 million for LSU in 2017, um, 16, 17 calendar year, uh, a million and 0.6 with LSU basketball and 500, over 560,000 for men's, uh, for LSU baseball. And what I had tweeted the other day was, if you look back at that, calendar year the, that athletic academic year 16-17 LSU football had four losses fired its coach LSU basketball had the yeah. worst season in conference history uh by finishing dead last in the SEC and LSU baseball went all the way to the championship and lost to Florida and and look at how much more money football made and how much more basketball made compared to baseball. I mean, it's it's just you. There is no equality. I think that's the problem is that people aren't realizing is that there is no equality in sports because sports in and of itself are a meritocracy. And I think Title IX kind of, while it's again good intentioned, it's not it's not feasible. <laughs> right. And. Again, it's a vestige of the fact the reason Title IX comes in this debate at all is because we are talking about sports that are tied to academics. And because a lot of these universities are publicly funded, Title IX governs that use of public funds, of taxpayer money. If instead of LSU having an athletic department that was tied to the university, there's a franchise called Louisiana State Football or something, uh, you know, Louisiana State Athletics, that wasn't officially part of the academic institution, then you could start talking about things like paying players. Um, you could start talking about all these things that would make it look more like a professional franchise. Um, but the downside of that, like I said, is that, okay, if you did run this like a for-profit business, the way that professional franchises are run, you wouldn't have the smaller sports that don't generate any revenue. It's because 
not only of things like Title IX, but just of the nature of college sports in general, the system that we have in place kind of as an accident of history for over 100 years where, for whatever reason, sports are a huge deal on college campuses. Um, it's a vestige of that system that you have the profitable sports like football and basketball propping up the unprofitable sport and allowing those sports to offer scholarships and things like that. But again, if you're somebody who wants players to get paid, especially in sports like football and basketball, there's a lot of money to be made then what you're really in effect arguing for is not not being able to finance those other sports through the athletic departments. So it gets complicated very quickly. Do you think that's right that football and basketball for most universities that they should just bail constantly just be bailing out smaller sports that I mean nobody really cares about? Do you think that that's right? Um I mean I, I hate to into a right or wrong discussion here because one I, I have a lot of sympathy for and respect for the student athletes who play those other sports I don't want to come across as saying that we should get rid of those sports that's not at all what I'm saying um, in fact you know a lot of schools do have those sports that don't even you know schools that don't even have football or basketball programs that rake in a lot of money still do offer a lot of these sports um, just it's not as well funded, obviously, because they don't get $56 million in football profits a year to distribute amongst the other sports. But I'm a big fan of all these college sports. I think they should be offered. It's just that because I'm somebody who does believe that we need to develop a more equitable market-like system in college sports that generate a lot of revenue, sports like football and basketball, um, I don't think that uh, athletic departments should feel obligated to prop up those other sports. Um, I'd rather they look more like kind of club related activities where they have to be self sustaining. Um, and again, I, I hesitate to say that just because as a professor, I have a lot of student athletes who play in those, what we might consider smaller sports. Um, and I don't want to propose anything that would hurt them adversely, but as somebody who believes that we should have a more market type system in athletics, especially for these football players generating and basketball players and baseball players generating a considerable amount of money for their universities. Um, it's just kind of the nature of the beast that one comes at the expense of the other. If you make football, basketball, and baseball um, stand alone and allow players to make money of those sports, that's money that can't go to these other sports nearly as much. Yeah, no, uh, I agree with most of that, but um... – so going back to, I guess, the, and I've only got a few more questions before you. Uh, going back to, I guess, these athletes who proposed this movement from the Pac-12, when they listed all these things out, some of them obviously are very reasonable and seem, you know, intelligent, as we've pointed out, but obviously some of, some of them just aren't realistic. So in your opinion, I mean, you're, you're in academia, uh, academia you're a you have students, you have student athletes. Where do you think they got this advice from to understand they want to get some leverage by ha having, you know, some demands and then, you know, finding somewhere in the middle as a compromise? Where do you think they got this advice from to where 50% of each sport's total conference revenue is evenly, you know, distributed among athletes and getting rid of, you know, bonuses and uh, for coaches? I mean, where do you think they got that advice from? You know, I'm reluctant to say because it'd be rank speculation. I don't know who they consulted with. Um, we really don't even know that much about the specific players in charge of this. Um, I was listening to an interview recently um, with a Stanford safety, Malik, I'm blanking out his last name, but um, a player who's involved in these discussions. He's a football player at Stanford University. And one of the things that he mentioned is that he acknowledged that it doesn't have full support amongst uh, – student athletes. Um, he, he guessed that somewhere around 60 to 80 percent of student athletes agree with the proposals listed here. But the biggest thing, and to me this is a more overarching point, one of the most important points that we should make about this We Are United platform, is that whenever you're talking about a labor strike of any type, whether it's a labor union striking against its employer uh, at some company in the private sector, or something like this where it's student athletes, at least uh, vowing to strike unless some of their demands met, that strike is only as strong as its members' commitment to upholding it. 
And one of the things that becomes very obvious when you start talking to Pac-12 athletes, especially the football players who have their season coming up soon and who play in the most revenue-generating sport, when you really press them on if they don't meet all these demands, will you really sit out for an entire season? Virtually all of them would back off that and say, no, 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 we, we want to play. Like, yeah, we put, you know, I, we agree in large part with the proposals that some of our teammates um, and fellow players at other institutions have put forward in these demands. However, very few of them, I think, are actually going to be willing to sit out the season. If it was 100% unity, if all the players truly did get together and propose these demands, Again, we've talked about how some of them are just unrealistic and wouldn't be met, but my guess is they could probably get half of these demands met if they, standed, if they stand united. And in fact, I think quite a few of these are going to be implemented, and I'm a big fan of a lot of the ones that probably will be implemented when it comes to things like hopefully name, image, and likeness, one-time transfer rules, uh, maintaining eligibility through the draft process, improved safety standards, and extended time for uh, using – uh, you know, having medical insurance for student athletes. Those are things I think are great ideas. Hopefully the Pac-12 and other conferences can incorporate those. But if the players insisted on the more unrealistic ones that we've talked about, I think that the Pac-12 would just have to flatly say no and call out their off basically and say, okay, how many of you are truly willing to sit out an entire season, especially if you're a junior or senior and you're playing in your last year of eligibility or you're trying to prepare and up your uh, draft stock for the NFL draft or the NBA draft? I don't think too many players are going to be, really be willing to stand by their commitment to sit out the season to get all these demands met. So again, if we view this as the first kind of opening salvo in a negotiation, then that's something that might be reasonable. It might very well be the case they can get some of these more realistic demands met. But I think the biggest obstacle that the We Are United movement is going to have is that I don't think they have complete unity amongst all their players and a complete commitment to sit out an entire season. That's just, to me, something that's going to be very unrealistic. I think good news for people like us who agree with a lot of what they said and people in that movement who uh, are kind of in the same boat as we are, is that COVID is going to speed up a lot of this for them. Uh, just, you know, the, the safety precautions, the the insurance, um, medical insurance, the, uh, I mean, even, you know, the, the lack of leadership in the NCAA to help these conferences during this difficult time to say, hey, we're just going to succeed from you and we're going to allow players to own their name, image, and likeness. So that's what I'm hoping, but we'll see. So, um, yeah. Two more questions, uh, and then I'll get you out. Um, so kind of going off of the documents themselves, I've heard for, I guess, past several months, or really a year, uh, if you want to, you know, beyond COVID, that if you made name, image, and likeness legal, owning your name, image, and likeness in college sports legal, people have argued that only the big market schools like USC, UCLA, Miami, Texas, whatever, would get all the advantages when it came to, hey, we can, you know, we've can, we got people living here in LA who are USC fans. You can do a commercial in Los Angeles as opposed to you know, a car commercial in Baton Rouge. Um, do you buy that? You There's that some truth. truth to that. Um, I'll, I'll say this. I don't, think like, I don't think schools like LSU and Alabama would be too hurt by that. If you're talking about the advantage that might confer to student athletes who play at schools like USC that are in giant cities, big markets, um, you could still make a heck of a lot of money if you're Joe Burrow in Louisiana or if you're Tua Tagovailoa or Jerry Judy in Alabama, even in those smaller markets off a of name, image, and likeness. So I, I, I don't think it would necessarily create a giant big city bias when it comes to college sports. But the fact of the matter is name, image, and likeness is going to further separate the haves from the have-nots. Um, it's going to probably mean – and again, I, I think some people think that the name, image, and likeness uh, clause and allowing players to profit off of the name, image, and likeness would do a lot more – would, would – would allow them to be paid a lot more than uh, they really would be. It's not the case that every player on Alabama or LSU's football team would be making a six-figure salary off a of name, image, and likeness. It's probably something that only affects top 
five to seven players on big name teams. And even still, it's probably not six figures that we're talking about. It's probably more like forty or sixty thousand dollars a year. But that said, that's still a big advantage for the bigger schools that have a bigger fan base, a bigger market share over schools like, you know, divisional or directional schools within different states. Um, you know, I worked in Alabama last year. Alabama and Auburn would do just fine with name, image, and likeness. They've got huge fan bases that are, you know, would probably chomp at the bit to make sure that someone like Cam Newton uh, was able to get money for their name, image, and likeness back when he was a player at Auburn. But schools like Troy, the school that I taught at, I don't think they'd be any of the players would really be making any money off a of name, image, and likeness. And if they did, it'd probably be a pretty trivial amount in the thousands of dollars or so. Um, but to kind of get back to the main point, I do think that name, image, and likeness would further serve to kind of consolidate and to benefit the haves versus the haves. I just don't think that's a bad thing. What name, image, and likeness probably means is that you have about 40 or 50 programs. Uh, let's just talk about college football. Simple. 40 or 50 programs um, that would truly stand out from the rest. Well, is that really that much different than what we have today with the Power Five versus the Group of Five schools? No. Probably not. And in fact, I do think that college football should move more to a system where you have different tiers, where the Power Five schools are only playing other Power Five schools, and they abide by a different set of rules than the Group of Five. The Group of Five probably doesn't have to worry about name, image, and likeness. Maybe they can abide by the type of rules that we have in place now on student-athletes. But those Power Five schools, the SEC, Pac-12, Big Ten, Big 12, those conferences, they probably, I think, should break away from the NCAA system and have, um, have a framework in place that does allow players to make money. And I'd be a big fan of that. And, yeah, at the end of the day, that does mean that you've got fewer major schools playing each other. But the truth is what, what I've just described to you, 40, 50, or 60 teams in that upper echelon, that power five um, playing each other, allowing students to make money, that looks a lot like professional sports where you have 30 to 40 professional teams playing in bigger markets where players are able to make money and things like that. And guess what? Professional sports ain't all that bad. We all love professional sports. I get the kind of nostalgia about wanting to keep college sports, college sports and keep them distinct. But if we're doing that at the expense of what's good for the players, allowing them to make money during their peak uh, earning potential years, I mean, there, there are plenty of college athletes who could be making money off a of name, image, and likeness who never get a chance to succeed at the next level. Just think about, um, oh gosh, I'm trying to come up with an example of my head. There's plenty of college basketball players who are fantastic at the college level who never get to make it at the NBA level. There are plenty of players like that who, uh, to me, Tim Tebow is a pretty good example. Now, granted, Tim Tebow did get drafted somehow in the first round of the NFL draft and make millions of dollars. But he, and maybe a better example, if, if, any, if your listeners remember Eric Crouch from Nebraska, oh, yeah. a Heisman winning option quarterback, he never played it down in the NFL. But if he could have made money off, so he never got to earn any money for being a fantastic football player at Nebraska. But had he been able to profit off of his name, image, and likeness, he probably would have been able to make a decent amount of money, maybe forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year at Nebraska. But instead, because of the rules that we have in place in this weird student athlete mature system that's so prevalent, he wasn't able to make any money off of that. And there's a bunch of examples like that um, that we can point to that just strike people as unfair. And I agree. I think that we should have a system that does look a little bit more like professional sports so that these players can be the beneficiaries of their own talents so kind of like off of that question what about schools like i've also heard arguments about like smu coming back if you made that possible or houston or even central florida um do you think those schools could actually become better or have a resurgence because of name image and likeness because they're in they've got big boosters they've got power five money I, I think they certainly could. Now, I would like to see those schools added, in that case, to the Power Five conferences. I think UCF, maybe they get added to the ACC. SMU and uh, Houston maybe can get added to the Big 12 or the SEC. But that's more the system I want to see. Like, my, if I could 
if I could redesign college football, just to take one sport as an example, if I could redesign college football, I'd have four power conferences with 16 or 18 teams in each of them. And they would only play each other. So there would be, say, 12 regular season games. You only play other power four conference teams. And, you know, the playoff is simply the four conference champions. So you, in effect, have an eight or a 16 team playoff based off of who wins the respective divisions and the respective conferences and all that stuff. That, to me, is a system that we should have in place. What's difficult to kind of tie this into some economics concepts, because I am an economics professor, after all, who talks about sports economics. In economics, we have a term called network effects. And that refers to the fact that, that once you're acclimated to a certain type of system, in this case, college sports, the amateur athlete model, the student athlete model, it's very difficult to switch to an entirely new system because you have to get virtually everyone to agree to it. It's tough to make change happen when you have been using a certain type of system so long because the transactions costs or the cost of moving on to a different system seem really, really high. And one interesting thing about this whole COVID ep epidemic to me is that it's a huge unexpected shock that I think does have a chance to push us more in the direction of switching to a different network or in other words, a different system. I hope that we do see that in college sports. I'd love to see college football and college basketball especially move to a different type of model. But it's very tough to do that unless you have these big events that serve as an impetus for major change because it turns out major change is very tough to get done. It's tough to get everyone to agree to things. But, I mean, I, I'm personally hoping that this is kind of something that pushes us in the direction of allowing co college athletes to be paid and having a system in place where you have power conferences uh, that devise rules that are more fair to student-athletes and make for a more level competitive playing field.